Five minutes max, let's go. Sketch the graph of each, read the transformations. You can use your notes if you want. Find the one is at five minutes. I don't find the X in the set yet. I'll do it uh, once we learn all the graphs, then we'll go to algebra. Find the minus up there. Two minutes left. Let's go through the answers. Name the transformations, that's the key step. If you can name the transformations, then doing these questions are real easy. So let's start off. Name me one transformation for the first one. Can I please have Trent? Name me one. Good. Up by three. So this three here, I personally put at the front. Normally you see it over here and it's plus three. It doesn't matter where the plus three is, it's separate from the function. So that does mean up three. It's one that's being separated from the function. Name me another one, Jamal. 
It's inverted because of the negative of the function. So this is inverted along the x-axis because whatever the y values are, you put a negative in front of it, it switches this way. So that makes sense. This is inverted. We know a, a, our graph normally looks like this. This is the square root function. So if you invert it, then it should now look like that. Okay, so that's the shape so far. I know it's gone up by three. I know it's inverted. And then what's the last transformation in Batulga? Uh, right, by two. right by two. Okay, so what, whatever you're affecting x, normally it's a root of x, you're changing the x values that affects your left and right. In our case, we've got x minus 2, and I always said letter equal to 0 and solve for x. x equals 2, because it's positive 2, I know it moves to the right by 2. So, so far, what you should have in your mental images is this is the shape, but it moves to the right by 2, so 1, 2, moves to the right by 2, and up 3, so 1, 2, 3. So this coordinate here, which is at 0, 0, moves to the right by 2, up by 3, and it should look like this. So looking at that equation, you don't have to work out the y-intercept because you already know there is no y-intercept based on that graph. But if you draw on it correctly, incorrectly or you read it incorrectly, then yeah. But then you should find out when you're finding it out um, doing the algebra. You see, it does make sense when y equals to 3 subtract. If x was 0 to find out your y-intercept, clearly you can't do the square root of negative 2. That's impossible. That's why it means you have no y intercept. Okay, so that makes sense. So that's your first graph. Hands up if you got that correct. Good, excellent. That's a good ratio. Next one, same thing. Let's read the transformations. What do I have? Ben, name me one. Um, the x Good. Moves to the left by 2. Again, it's what you're affecting the x value. So you've got x plus 2, let equal 0, x equals negative 2, so left by 2. What type of function is this, uh, Xi'an? Truncus. Truncus, good. So it looks like a truncus. Great. Name me one more transformation, Ian. It's inverted, and that's a negative. It's not on the x, it's currently negative of the function, so that's why it's inverted upside down. Okay, so now we know that's the shape, and then finally, 3 makes it thinner. The 3 will make it thinner, but in our case, if you're just drawing one graph, no one can tell. Okay, so it just doesn't matter. All right, it's only when you're doing comparison. So, so far, this is my graph. It moves to the left by 2, so it changes the vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. And it doesn't move up or down, so still you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. That hasn't changed, and it is a truncus function, so it should look like this. Yes? Yeah, oh, well, you're pretty smart to figure it out. <coughs> and the last one, uh, we can read this is up one, and again, this is negative of the function. Uh, so it's a reflection on your x-axis, so you pretend there's a mirror on the x-axis, and that means the shape normally looks like this. Sorry, that one's poorly done there. Normally it looks like this, but because you're putting a negative, it now flips and it goes this way for both cases. Okay, so that's your shape, but it goes up by one, so that means your asymptote now Instead of being y equals 0, it moves up by 1, so y equals 1, and the shape is like this. Okay, finding out the y intercept for each one, let x equal to 0, so the first one over here should have been negative 3 quarters, and whoops, this one over here, if you let, there's no y intercept actually, asymptote, because when x equals 0, it's undefined. Okay. 
So there you go, you got your three shapes, but again, it's just using the same transformations throughout. The one thing I didn't talk about though, which I thought I mentioned, um, is the B term. And I told you I didn't want to talk about the B term because that dilates it horizontally, uh, but I did also forget to tell you that there is also an inversion or inverted, uh, it affects it horizontally when you have an inversion horizontally. Okay, so what I mean by that is I can change this equation here if I had changed x to negative x. Okay, so if I now have y equals to 3 subtract root negative x minus 2, everything else is pretty similar. We've got up by 3. This is still inverted, but remember this is inverted on your x-axis. Okay, so that means with this current shape, negative of all your function or all your values this is all your y values right now if you put a negative on it it changes positive y values become negative that's why it flips on the x-axis that's what the negative does but then if you put a negative on the x values it means before it is positive it is now negative okay that's that's what's happening so what naturally happens is the graph will now flip on your y-axis. So you can think of it as when you affect your y's you flip it along the y values where it's positive it becomes negative. If you put a negative on the x it flips it horizontally and it flips along the y-axis so from positive x to negative x so it will look like that. Okay so what I'm trying to say is there is a difference between this is your root x there's a difference between y equals to negative of root x See, that's saying whatever my root x is, I'm going to put a negative in front of it. So it changes all the y values, because that's what y equals to. Okay? Another way of thinking about it is that's negative of y. Okay? Whereas versus y equals to root of negative of x, that is now changing all the x values. Now the question is why haven't I talked about this previously? Because all the graphs that you've been doing previously, you can't really tell. I'll give you an example. You can't really tell, but there should be. There should be that um, explanation in it. Take uh, your quadratics. That was a bad one. Let's do it again. Take your quadratics. When I gave you y equals x squared back then, why is it that when you say y equals negative of x squared, you knew it was upside down? And that's because we're saying this is your y values. So all the y values are here. When you put a negative, you're now saying all the y values become negative. So you flip all the y values. So if that was y equals 1, y is now negative 1. That's why it flips horizontally, I mean vertically. Yeah? Then technically there should be a difference when you do negative of the x. See the difference between the two? One is the function stays as it, as it is and I times it by a negative 1 versus I change the x values before I apply the function. Now that should mean that there's a reflection, every x value becomes negative. But you never saw it in a quadratic because if I actually expand that graph, that ends up being the same thing. And the reason why is because if you did flip it, if this was when x is 1, now it becomes a negative 1, well, negative 1 squared still gives you the same value as 1. Symmetrically, if I flipped it across, it's still symmetrical. That's why you never saw it. Same thing with a straight line equation when you first learnt it in year 9, y, we couldn't tell the difference. See, y equals to x looks like this. And then we put a negative in front of it, that means take all the x values and flip it. And so all this becomes now this, which is why we call that the negative x graph. But again, what you don't realise is, yes you can flip it horizontally, I mean vertically, but you could also flip it horizontally and it'll still be exactly the same. See if I took all these values and I switched it across, if I took this corner and I switched over here, it's still going to give you the same graph. That's why you can't tell the difference between y equals negative of x versus y equals to negative of x. See the difference on how I'm writing them? One's a negative times the function, one's I affect, I affect the x values first. There's a difference between the two. But you don't see it in your linear, which is the first graph you learn. You don't see it in quadratics, which is the second graph you learn. And then cubics, 
should have been the one that you see, but we don't deal with it as often. You only learnt the those points. And then, funny enough, the first function that you learnt in this chapter four also doesn't show it to you. The first function you learnt in this one was a rectangular hyperbola, one on x. You see, y equals to, if I put a negative in front of it, that's saying, if this is your graph, putting a negative in front of it means all these y values now flip to become negative. So if this point flips to become negative, it sits here. So naturally, it inverts, and that one, if it's negative, it becomes positive. Naturally, it looks like that. So that's why we say negative makes it a flip. But funny enough, this one, there's no difference if I had wrote this. y equals 1 on negative x. So there is a y-axis reflection, it's just that you don't see it. Because if I simplify this, this is just the same thing as saying no. That's why you don't see it. So the only time that you really got to see it is in the square root function that you actually see. So it is there, it's just you don't see it. Even like the truncus. If we did the truncus, same thing. The reason why you're not seeing all this is y equals 1 on x squared. Same, same drill. See, there is a difference between y equals the negative of 1x squared. So that makes sense. All the y values now flip. So you get this graph. That's what the negative of 1 on x squared looks like. But then why don't you see a difference with y equals 1 on, and you affect the x, is because when you square it, it ends up being the same. Or if you think about it logically, if I affect all my x values, if I change this from 1 to a negative 1, it's symmetrical. It doesn't seem to change anything. It's like you're quadratic. That's why you didn't see it. But the times that you do see it is a square root function. This is the only one that you can flip it horizontally and it'll look like that. Or you can flip it vertically and it looks like this. Or you can flip it vertically and horizontally and it looks like that. So if I show you, that's root of x. Oops. If I want to make it to the bottom, flip it vertically, then I'd say negative root of x. If I want to affect my x values to make it change that direction, then I'd say root of negative x. See the difference? I'm affecting my x values. If I want to affect both my x and y, because I flip it vertically and then flip it horizontally, then this one would be negative of negative x. Does that make sense, what we're doing here? Yeah? Yes, Trent. How do you not negative? Yes. That's why it only works in this direction. You see, if x was a negative 1, two negatives make a positive. Yeah. But, yeah, but if x was, okay, let's say, if x was negative 1, then you would have to negative Then it doesn't work. And that's why, so if I asked, yeah? So if I said negative of x, and what numbers can't you have? You can't have one. You're right. You can't have one. That's why the graph only looks like that. That's why you can't have an x equals one. Yeah. You're not rooting a negative. Yeah. Yes. That's good. Yes. Because it still hold. It still holds. That the smallest number you can do is yeah. zero. If it's a one, then it would be negative, yes. So if it's one minus two, that's why the the. Two to the right, but the shape will look like this. That would be negative. Yeah. Oh, oh, negative x. Oh, sorry. So you're saying like this? Then it'll be like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, wait, wait. Does this still go... If you let it equal to zero... No. Let's see. Negative two. So that means it's two to the left. And it looks like that. Then now it makes sense. Okay, negative x plus 2, then that would mean it's 2 to the right, 
and and it is so it'll be like this. Whoops. And it still works because if x is one, negative one plus two is okay. Yeah. Whereas the maximum number you can have is two because negative two plus two will make it zero, and that's as small as you can. Anything greater, negative three plus two, won't work. And that's why who's left, right, left, down. Yeah. All right. Cool. So that's a sort of a summary of what you've done in the previous ones. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is because I know circles you've done in specialist, and so some of you would be pretty proficient at it, some of you aren't. So I'm just going to go through quickly sort of how to quickly read them and, and then get you to practice on a bit on circles. Next session I'll talk about semicircles, and that's more methods there. But uh, if you understood circles from spec, this is pretty easy. Okay, no? <laughs> All right. The x squared plus y squared equals r squared. This is the equation for a circle. And that's coming from a simple circle where they chose a coordinate, p of x, y. So a point, p, has x, y coordinates. And for every coordinate, you have an x length and a y value, which is your height. And it just happens to be that it's a right angle triangle and we can use Pythagoras' theorem, and that's why it's x squared plus y squared is equal to whatever the radius of the circle is, r squared. Okay, and that gives you every corner, depending on how you change the x and change the y's, that technically plots out the whole points of a circle. Okay, so now that we know it's a circle, and that, that's why r squared dictates the radius, because from here to here, that's one, and that's why you always have to square root the number. So if this was, uh, it was the one that I'm looking for. No, not that one. Um, if this is 25, so x squared plus y squared, we know this is 5 squared. That's why the radius is 5. Okay? Now, everything I taught you so far still applies. The only difference here is the y. You know how I told you when it goes up and down, I said it's always separate from the function. The problem now is this is the function. So if you want to know if it goes up or down, you still use the same technique I gave you, let this equal to zero. If you let it equal to zero, if you solve for it, if y is positive, then it's up. If y is negative, then it's down. Okay? So that's the only difference, and it's the reason why you're memorizing this for now is just because I haven't taught you transformations. It takes a lot of effort to get your head around transformations, then all this will make sense. But prior to that, memorize this for now, what I'm showing you. Um, this technique I made up, so you won't find on YouTube or anything, it's just something that helps you solve and figure out whether it goes left or right. So if you want to know if it goes left or right, it's what you're affecting the x values. In our case, let this equal to zero and solve for x positive or negative will tell you right and left. And when we say left and right, we're really saying it's the center. See, the center is 0, 0, and all these endpoints will move according to the transformation you say there. Okay, so how do you tell the um, where, where the centers move? The nice, is, nice thing is because it starts at 0, 0. So if I said it moves to the right by 3, then this naturally moves to the right by 3 as well, because all coordinates move to the right by 3. So then you know it's 3, 0 is where your center is. So what I'm trying to say is if I said if I did x minus 3 squared plus y squared equals to 1, this is a circle, moves to the right by 3. Yeah, it doesn't go up or down. So I can actually just shift this whole thing and I can say the center must be at 3, 0. And it's still a radius of 1. So if that's 3, this has to be maximum of 2. This has to be 4. And this is still 1, negative 1. Okay? That's how you draw your, your graphs. Label your center and any endpoints that you need. Okay? Let's have a look at this one. Very similar to your specialist thing. Write down the equation of the circle with center negative 3, 5. Negative 3, 5, you think about your axes, negative 3, 5, that means up 5 and left 3. So if you were to demonstrate that using the equation, you know 
it has to be x plus 3 to make it move to the left by 3. And to make it up 5, you know it has to be y minus 5. That will move it up by 5. And your radius, they said radius of 2, so 2 squared. So your equation should be x plus 3 squared plus y minus 5 squared equals 4. Cool? All right, so it's just, I'm just reconfirming what you learnt in, in special. That's all. Yeah? Now the only uh, tricky ones, find the center, so if you can read this. Let's read the transformations for this. What's my radius for this graph? Two. Transformations? Good, so to the right by one, and? Sorry, did you say the other one? This is right by one, and what's the other one? Yeah, right by one, <laughs> up by two. Sorry. And radius two. Okay. So if you were to find the center, clearly if you move to the right by one, up by two, it has to be at one, two. Because you move to the right by one, up by two, that's your new center now. Started at zero. That's your center and radius of two. You can sketch your graph, but it doesn't ask you to sketch at this point. Okay, but if you were to sketch right by two, so if I moved across two, one plus two gives you three, one subtract two gives you negative one, and then from 2, add 2 makes it 4. And then 2 take away 2 is 0. So I've got my circle roughly kind of like that. I didn't draw a very good one, but yeah, you get the idea. Yeah? The last one. Now from special, you probably would have been a bit more familiar with this. How do you solve this? What do you have to do? What's the technique, Jamal? Complete the square. Okay, so this is not in the form of what you had before. See here, you had perfect square, perfect square. The only way to get a perfect square from quadratics was complete the square. So if you have a look at this, that's not a perfect square. So you have to rearrange them all together, x squared minus 6x, and you've got y squared plus 4y equals to 0. Your goal is to make this a perfect square. Okay, and doing your perfect squares, I'll just quickly show you again. The constant has to be half the b term, Square it, so half of negative 6 is negative 3 squared. That means if I had plus 9, it's a perfect square. But you can't add it on, so you have to subtract it as well. That hasn't changed the equation. Same thing with this one. Half the b term, square it, plus 4 minus 4. Perfect square, y plus 2 squared, perfect square, x minus 3 squared. And you've got minus 9, minus 4, so minus 9 minus 4. Minus 13. Oh, minus 12. Sorry, I didn't see that. Thank you. Okay, so minus 25. So therefore, there you go. There you go. And if you move the 25 across, that's your radius of 5. So your equation's y squared plus y plus 2 squared equals y squared. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's start off with exercise 4D. Just do question 3 and 4. Practice your, you know, sketching the graphs and then find the centers of each one. 4D. 4D. Before we go to 4E tomorrow. Okay. Here you go. <coughs> Just do three and four. Don't have to do the others, just do three and four, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs>